hope you are sitting comfy spot somewhere with a wee beverage to keep you hydrated and your brain is ready to engage. I'm Alice Sharp, your host for this week's TTS Talking Early Years podcast. I'm a teacher, an educator, conference speaker and an author of a continuous professional development programme called Adventures with Alice. Throughout this series, we're exploring the magic of play-based learning in the early years. We're turning a lens on how this approach supports the development of key skills for our children and, of course, our staff too. I'll be talking to a number of educational experts um, as we aim to inspire you all every day for your work and to unlock the potential for learning in our lovely sector. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce two fabulous ladies, Liz Ludden and Sue Eggerstoff, are today's guests. Can you imagine it, guys? Hello, ladies. How are you today? Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you, Liz? I'm good, thank you. Um, are you feeling fabulous? I'm feeling fabulous, yeah, thank you. Are you feeling fabulous, Sue? We're fabulous together. We're, We're fabulous, fabulous together. Well, you always are. So a huge warm welcome to you both. Um, you. And before we get started on our big discussion, could you give us a wee introduction to yourselves, guys? So, Liz, if you go first, that would be fab. Right. Um, I'm Liz Ludden, and I'm a teacher in Liverpool and um, Dukes and Duchesses. We've been operating for 20 years now. That makes me feel really old. Um, more recently, I'm a trustee for a Liverpool-based charity, Res Generations. And together with Sue, we've opened um, the nursery in Belong in Chester. Fab. And Sue, who are you? Tell us all about yourselves. So Liz thinks she's old. I'm the oldest person on the planet, <laughs> nearly. So I've been working in early years for over 40 years now. Um, as a head teacher in a nursery in an infant school, and then with Sure Start, if anybody remembers Sure Start, and if anybody even remembers the National Professional Qualification in Integrated Centre Leadership, the most ridiculous name, um, I ran that programme. So um, I'm now working closely with Liz every day in our nursery in Chester. Fab, brilliant. Okay, so. Let's begin our discussion today then, and I believe we're going to have a big discussion about intergenerational practice, which is fab, because I don't know a huge amount about it. You know, I've heard bits and pieces about interge intergenerational care, about intergenerational learning, about intergenerational practice, and I wonder what the difference is between the three of them. Um, you know, what's happening in Scotland, England, Ireland, Wales, it's happening, you know, I read some research from Singapore and Australia too, but what we'd love to hear, of course, guys, is your take on this approach um, and if you could share any evidence that backs up that it has a positive impact for our children and families? Yeah, of course. Intergenerational sounds such a long word. Um, you know, people struggle to get the, their head around what it actually is. But um, really, it's just we call it living lives together, don't we? So put quite simply, it's about connecting people of all ages together. So some people refer to multi-generational work rather than intergenerational. And I think that's just semantics, really. It's yeah. anything that brings people together. So in our case, it's uh, preschool children with elders in a care village. Brilliant. Um, so there's lots of, 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 of kind of practice going on at the moment, but there's not a lot of research because it's quite a new thing. Okay. So there's very few papers written on it. And um, you know, we're trying to move that practice on with colleagues from Generations Working Together up in Scotland, who we work closely with, and okay. also Apples and Honey Nightingale, which many people will have heard of down in London, who have been doing this for even longer than us. Okay. And I guess you're, what you're describing there, generations working together, um, and that means a huge gain for everybody from a skills perspective, from a values perspective, and from, from a knowledge and understanding perspective as well. So what, what, kind of, what can you say to the people who are listening to convince them that this is, if, if we don't do it, will we miss something? You know, what, what does this extra dimension, I guess, to our sector bring in speed fools, could you suggest, guys? Well, many people uh, that we talk to say, yes, we do that. We take the children along to a care village, you know, at Christmas or at Easter, and we sing or we do whatever together. 
I think what we're about is taking that a step further. So acknowledging that that has a value, but actually being really clear if you work in a deeper way, uh, the consistent and the kind of progression in terms of relationships, in terms of language development can happen when there are consistent relationships built over time and the children and the older people trust and know each other. Um, and then basically what we found we've got is a brand new workforce of older yeah. people who support the children's learning. And we actually call them our educators. They bring value to the children's learning in a way that, you know, we're all really busy, aren't we? Uh, yeah. But if you've got a group of elders sat reading stories to children or uh, telling them stories, then it's amazing what happens. The magic just unfills in front of you. And you never know what's going to happen because every day is unique and different because the the skill set that the older people bring, they actually are the teachers without even knowing because that's the way when we go back that we used to live, you know, hundreds of years ago, we lived in intergenerational communities where we all supported each other. But as we've become more mobile, things have changed very much in society, but this is doing things in a in a new and different way. Um, and, you know, we're still very early days, but every day for us, we call them halo moments. We just see these things that, that happen um, and and it gives both parties the, the opportunity to develop and grow with each other. And I guess, I mean, never a day goes by really when you're not hearing about the older generation feeling lonely, um, you know, or being isolated because the extended family that we used to all really be a part of has kind of been broken a wee bit in the way that we now live our lives and communities spread. And, you know, I was speaking to a friend who's three children and now therefore grandchildren are at three different corners of the world now. And so they don't have the intergenerational Sunday experience that maybe we all used to have. And so what you're offering through what you give. And I loved when you said um, the step further in that I have heard stories of um, the children being taken into the old folks' home and performing some songs. You know, and I, I actually went one day with a, with a group who told me, the children said, oh, we're going, we're going next door to, to sing. And I said, oh, brilliant. And I'm assuming in my head, that they're going to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and we went in and they sang three Elvis numbers because three of the old men in the, the home loved Elvis so they, the children had learned these Elvis songs and I thought that was really lovely but it, it wasn't it wasn't as integrated as you're kind of expressing it to be for me um, and, and so I think that that kind of trust that you mentioned there as well um, and, and the fact that you see relationships progressing because I would think if you're just doing the generational the, the kind of multi-generational and not the intergenerational, that it, it's just doing an activity, then another activity, then another activity. So I guess the progression wouldn't be as noticeable, perhaps. What do you think yeah. gives you that extra I, I step? Think, well, I think in early years practice, what we all know is relationships matter. Mm -hmm. If that foundational block isn't in place, it's really hard for children's learning to really take off. If the adults around them uh, they don't feel um, there's that trust there. So um, by just visiting care homes, it's a lovely experience. It can be a lovely experience, but it doesn't support learning. So what we're trying to research in our work is the impact of sustained relationships in terms of actually building communities for children. So it's not just about intergenerational kind of togetherness, it's about creating a new sense of a community for children, which as you said, Alice, you know, has been lost latterly. So yeah. it, it, you know, people say, oh, this is a new thing. And what Liz and I say is it's not new. It's how I remember growing up and many of us of my generation would remember that the yeah. street was your community and Mary, the old lady that lived at the bottom, you know, if she told you off, you really felt it. Yeah. Uh, it, or if she made you, you know, an ice cream in the summer, it was a real treat. So it's kind of rebuilding that sense of community. So I'd rather call it community building in some ways than intergenerational work. Yeah. And it's not just the older people. We hear a lot about older people feeling lonely and isolated. 
but in actual fact our families tell us that that some of them are, are feeling lonely as well so they're in they've moved into a community that is not where they were brought up they've moved away from their families young families with with young children don't have extended families on their doorstep yeah. so this is developing that community and when people say to us or when we talk about what we're doing and we're so passionate about it and we feel like we're always talking about it and, and everybody says oh isn't that lovely and what we we're saying to them actually it's more than lovely so it is that one step further because we are community building we're giving something back in in to the the um the community that that already exists and um it's reciprocal so it's not just one party is gaining from it that the whole community and the whole family unit are gaining from it and I guess you're making me think of projects we've done in the past with parents and so we had a group of dads and a group of mums that we took um, who volunteered in some of the settings um, and they came and they did their kind of level two qualification with us and then their level three qualification and some have gone on to do degrees and they're a lot of them are working in the sector now and these were mostly parents who who didn't see themselves ever working uh, in our sector at all and I'm now thinking why do we not think about looking at grandparents or or just people who've retired you know they might not never have actually had children of their own so they were never going to be a grandparent but they've got so much to offer so that way that you describe that Liz there that it's not just about old people and going into the old folks home it's so much more than that it's that the breadth of of purpose for both the children and the the other generations that they're going to interact with I guess would be just huge and I think being purposeful is really important in everybody's life yeah, I mean, one of the questions or two of the questions that we ask ourselves consistently when we're thinking and monitoring and evaluating is what is learning and who are the educators? And what we found is the educators go far beyond our team, that we have kind of, this, kind of 117 of the uh, potential educators in our care village. And every one of those brings something quite unique to the children. Some of them bring more than others. Yeah. Uh, some are with us every day, doing very specific things with us. And some of them we learn magical things about almost every day. Yesterday, I learned that somebody was um, a calligrapher and um, produced all the calligraphy for the army dinners. He was an army man, yeah. and he uh, and he's a beautiful writer. So we intend to get him down to show the children a bit of his work. And, you know, we never knew that. How would we have had access to that in any other way? Yeah. And I think one of the things we did when we set up the nursery um, and we were waiting for the building to be finished because it's an, a new building, we had a, a, a kind of list of, of children that wanted to come to the nursery. And Liz and I felt we needed to ring the parents and explain that it wasn't an ordinary kind of nursery, that there'll be old people learning alongside the children, just to make sure pe parents were aware and they all said, please stop. We've researched this. This is what we want for our children. We have no family around us and we want them to have access to older people. So it's wow. kind of a family building thing, yeah. which was really special for us, really special. And Liz, do you think it's enhanced your staff's appreciation of, of the ability to learn from everybody, that kind of um, vision you've got of the hundred and odd teachers and, and educators now are, are not just us. Do the staff see people in a different light, do you think? Yeah, and our staff are coming to us um, and are reporting that their well-being is really, really high because um, what the older people bring is time. So everything is at a much slower pace. Um, so they're coming to us from, from various different um, different nurseries across across the um across Chester. But what they're reporting is that their their well being is high because they're working alongside different professionals, they're working alongside um the older people who bring different skills. For example, we were looking at the book Lost and Found. We shared it with some of our older friends and instantly one of them said, Do you know, I collect penguins. 
And they went up, they brought down a collection of penguins that they'd been collecting for over 50 years. Wow. And all of a sudden, that just took on a whole new life. They were talking about where they'd got them from. They were looking at the, the maps. They were, they were looking at old photographs of where they, they collected them from. They were handling the, these beautiful objects in, in such a respectful way because one of their friends had brought them down and they knew that they were special. They knew that they were, they were purposeful. And for them, the staff were able to observe that interaction and almost sit back because it wasn't them that was leading it. It was the, the older friends who were leading it and the children themselves. So they were asking the questions about it. They were feeling the, the penguins. They were studying them. They were comparing them. You know, I know that's right up your street, Alice, because I know you're a huge collector of things. <laughs> so I can see you getting all fizzy about that, that, that penguin collection already. But, um, but yeah, that was just a magical moment for us and for the team. And I think what you've just said there, you know, I was talking to my husband recently, Liz, and I was saying, what is my what is my thing? You know, so-and-so is associated with this theory and that theory and da-da-da-da. What is my thing? And my thing is things. You know, and I talked about the theory of things was my I'm gonna I'm gonna start looking at the theory of things. And and what you've just described for me is so often we see um settings or schools setting up in situations contexts I guess that might look a bit old-fashioned and and in the past and and it might not be particularly meaningful um to, to set a child to play in that kind of area you know some of the grandparents I know uh, are in their 20s and um, that's the reality of life now, that grannies are not all grey-haired, permed ladies anymore <laughs> with walking sticks, the way they might have been kind of portrayed in the past. You know, the, one of our youngest uh, grandparents that we know of in, in Northern Ireland is 28 that, in the nursery just now. And and so setting up a, a, a learning situation, um, like a, an old-fashioned home corner, has purpose. I'm not suggesting it doesn't have purpose, but what you've just described to me is something that mean, makes such an impact and allows people to share the memories of other people. It's almost like a talking museum that you're setting up there because we've got so much to learn from each other. You know, every Remembrance Day, you think we're losing all of these stories, all of these memories and these past histories and part of our culture and the heritage because of the breakdown of this extended community that we used to live in. And you're describing a way of getting it back, guys. And that is just huge, massive. You know, so what do you think if you could both say what's the most important thing, Sue, that you've learned through this experience that you are now a part of? And then, Liz, you can tell us. So, Sue, what's the most important thing you've gained from it? The most important thing that I've learned is that we need to slow down and that being with older people, life is slower. And that gives you actual time to have proper conversations. So instead of directing children, we're doing this, we're doing this next, let's move on, da, da, da. We're in suit, let's absolutely slow it down because Edna is 95 and she wants to have a slower conversation with you. And what I've learned is, what I always knew, but it's reminded me, our children are incredible relationship builders. Yeah. They're intuitive, they're full of empathy, they have a natural gentleness towards things. And we lose that sometimes by rushing them along. And it comes back when you let them slow down. You just it just comes back so beautifully. Fab. Liz, one thing. Um, the most important the power of relationships, I'd say, and um just how important it is to really know each other and to spend time alongside each other so slow pet so the top two tips from this lovely little session then guys is to slow down and i find that a challenge because i live my life at 180 miles an hour because society is so pressured now and so surrounding myself by people that are perhaps in a different generation might help me to gain that skill the way it is helping your staff i guess and, and Liz, you couldn't be more to connection and attachment and relationships. We kind of always assume it's with babies. But actually, how much you seem to be gaining from building those connections and relationships in a, in a very different generation. Um, and it's making a huge impact. So that is really powerful stuff. Fabulous. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm.
So I would love to say a huge thank you to our guests for joining us today and providing us with such valuable insights. You've been listening to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Alice Sharp, and the amazing Liz London and fabulous Sue Eggerstock. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. It has just been joyous. I think that's the word for today. Uh, if you've been inspired by our conversations today, don't forget you can sign up via the link in our episode notes to be the first to hear about future episodes and access exclusive follow-up content. Oh my goodness me. There are trillions, trillions of ideas for your settings and Pinterest boards to shop resources relevant to the topics that's been discussed today and throughout our podcast episodes. Thank you.